and welcome to the Better People Podcast. I'm Holly De Palma, and my guest today is Jamie Hines, uh, the Chief Human Resources Officer at Rectangle Health. Good morning, Jamie, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, um, uh, I uh, tell me a little bit about your trajectory to your current role, where it looks like you are recently. Um, you've recently begun this this job. Yeah, so I started out in HR um, about almost 18 years ago. So really got my first, I have my um, undergrad degree in HR management from Penn State. I also have an MBA from Penn State as well with a focus in HR, but actually started out um, in HR working um, through a temp agency. I got a role with an, as a training support specialist covering for someone that was on maternity leave. Um, and then wound up getting hired on full time at that company, um, first in um, HR or in training and then moving over into HR. Um, and then from there, I've kind of worked all over the place and I've grown my career since then. I've worked in hospitality as a recruiter. I've worked in retail as a generalist. I've worked in a government contract for a government contractor. I've worked in healthcare. I've worked in digital marketing. And every time I've kind of grown, I've been able to grow my career. So um, my current role, I just started at the beginning of this year. So I'm the chief HR officer for a company called Rectangle Health. So we're a, a private equity um, backed um, healthcare SaaS tech company. Um, so I was brought on to really build out their HR function and get them ready to continue to scale and grow. Um, I've done that several times before in previous roles. So uh, yeah, I started out, like I said, as a training specialist and, and worked my way, way up over the last 18 years to heading my own department. And and running a, a business unit in a large organization. Yeah, how, so that's exciting. Um, tell me about your, uh, tell me a little bit about Rectangle Health. Yeah, so Rectangle Health, um, like I said, they're a healthcare SaaS company. So mm -hmm. they've been around for 30 years. They're actually at 30th mm -hmm. anniversary is actually later is next week. Oh, so um, they, congratulations. Uh, were, they were a small company up until about two and a half years ago. They were, you know, about 60, 70 people. And then took on a private equity investment um, in late 2021, have grown since then, have done a couple acquisitions since bringing on the private equity firm, um, and you know are looking to continue to grow via both organically and, and acquisition. So, you know, they're, they're I guess, an organization that's experienced rapid growth in a short period of time and are going to continue to grow moving forward. So what are your sort of your to-do lists? Um... Yeah, if you can see my to-do list, it's probably about four pages long. Right now, I, I think every day I add more things to my to-do list than I actually take off. Um, but really right now, my main focus is creating the structure and the process and procedures from an HR standpoint to get us ready for that growth. So the way, the best way that I can describe the, the culture at Rectangle is we're very much a 30-year-old company that works in startup mode. So you know, prior you know, to two years ago, everybody kind of had their hands in multiple buckets and everybody you know, had, you know, were very scrappy and hands-on and all that. But now we're at the point where we need to have those formal processes and procedures in place, like a formal recruitment process, a formal performance review process, compensation and, and doing market reviews and creating compensation grades and standardizing benefits and all of those things that you would think a 30-year-old company would have, but don't because they were so small for so long. So that's that's my job um, right now is my focus is to really stand up that HR function. Um, as well as transition it from being a transactional function, which is typically, you know, how HR has been seen in the past, to more of a, a business partner model. That HR is not just here to do those transactional things. We are here to help out in so many other areas as well. So building the department and building the team um, with that people business partner mindset, uh, that's where we want to be in the future. Yeah, got it. Um, so talk to me about the culture and about um, sort of uh, the process of acquisitions and uh, sort of bringing folks into the fold. Yeah, so the culture here, like I said, you know, everybody is, is I mean, they're, everybody's amazing. Um, everybody is very, like, they're scrappy, they're hands-on, they are, you know, they love what they do. There's a lot of loyalty here. Um, we have, we did just bring on a new CEO in the company um, about a month ago. So he brings a fresh energy and a fresh perspective to the company, which is a really exciting time for us, um, he has a great vision. He has a great vision for HR as well. He and I partner very closely together. 
So I'm excited to see what the future what the future holds with the company. Um, and if that culture shifts a little bit with having new leadership, you know, like I said, he brings a lot more energy, he brings new energy and new life to the organization. So I'm sure that's, you know, the culture that we have now will probably shift a little bit in the future. So you mentioned, I'm going to go back in your career a little bit. You mentioned um, all different kinds of industries that you've worked in. Talk to me about your uh, sort of your observations about the different verticals that you were in, yet also the similarities that you have found. Yeah, I would say the probably the most glaring difference was I went from working for a healthcare company um, that really was truly in healthcare. We we provided physicians and and physician assistants and things staffing to hospitals. So it truly was healthcare working with medical professionals. And then moving from there where it's highly regulated, you know, there's a lot of process, a very large company. We were 20,000 people when I left and, you know, it was, it was very busy. Um, and then move from there into digital marketing, which if you think of digital marketing is the complete opposite, um, a very, very young demographic, you know, average age of the employees of our company was like 25, 26. So very, very young, very different mindset um, of working with, with physicians. So that was definitely a, an interesting shift. Um, I remember when I when I got the job at my first digital marketing agency, I was like, is this really for real? Like all of the benefits, all the perks I'm getting, like, is this really like, is this really a thing? Do people get this? Because I've never had this working at companies before. Um, so they were very much employee centric. You know, they they didn't just talk the talk. They walked the walk as well. And they really focused on their employees and making sure their employees um, were their first priority. And that was because it's a, diff- a little bit of a different mind shift from working working in healthcare. So they were kind of both polar opposites of the spectrum. Yeah, tell me about some of the perks and some of the some of the differences in digital marketing. Yeah, so digital marketing, you know, it was the first time I worked in a company that had a limited PTO that you could take as much time off as you wanted. There was guidelines around it. You know, you couldn't take more than three weeks off at a time, and you couldn't if you took a big chunk of time, you had to wait three months to take another big chunk of time, but you could take three take three weeks off and that was fine. I've never had that before. I've probably only had a total of three weeks PTO for an entire year, not be able to take three weeks at one time and then take more. So that was that was something different. Um, you know, very much it was a remote environment. So I worked while we had offices. I also was, I worked from home as well. So I was really only in our office. Um, one, maybe two days a month. So, you know, was that flexibility of, if you want to come in an office, that's great. And if you don't want to, that's fine as well. You're, there's no requirement to you to be in the office. Um, that was the first time I'd really worked in a fully remote role like that, where my team was also dispersed um, remotely. So that was one, I mean, little things like when you're in the office, they provided lunch for you. So three days a week, we had a caterer come into the office to provide lunch for the for the office. Um, they provided, if you worked from home, you got a snack stipend every quarter that you could buy snacks for your house. Um, the wellness perks, you know, the gym, the gym reimbursement. Um, we had a, a, we used a perk called fringe where everybody got a certain dollar amount every, every month. And you could use those points on things like if you want to use it for like your Netflix subscription or your Xbox subscription, or if you want to save it up and do like a wine of the month club or, you know, coffee and tea in the month club, things like that. There was a gym reimbursement where we gave everybody dollars to, to go use whatever they wanted to do for fitness. You know, I used my reimbursement to buy an erg for at home because my son's a rower and my my fitness stipend covered the, the cost of an erg. So nobody's paid for, you know, ever paid for me to go work out before or to buy equipment from my house. Um, and it was that flexibility to be able to work from work from anywhere, you know, and, and there was um, in the summertime from Memorial Day to Labor Day, we had summer Friday. So the office is closed at one o'clock on Friday. So you weren't expected to do any work. Um, we had like 15 holidays, like so much, so many things. That Why I would you ever leave that job? Experienced before, um, and I was like, "Is this real? Is this really real?" You know, my I always joke. My husband always said that I didn't have a I didn't have a real job. That I, I, I was just pretending to work when I was there because I we had all these these additional perks and benefits. How and how did all that translate into the company's success? Yeah, it gave. Um, it empowered everybody to do to do their job. There was no micromanaging and it wasn't like you had to be logged on for a certain amount of time every day. You know, you could kind of flex it if you needed to log in the morning for a few hours and then like go take an hour or two and go hit the gym in the middle of the day and come back and work. There was nothing that said you had to be on consistently from like nine to five. Some people are early morning people, some people are late people. As long as you were getting your work done and your, your clients were satisfied, there was no mandate of you have to work between these hours and, and these hours. Um, which, like I said, looking at 
the different generations that are at, in the workforce right now, the generation that's that's coming up in the workforce right now, that's what they want. They want that flexibility. They want to be, to be able to make their own hours. They want the ability to work wherever they want. They want that work-life balance. They want to be able to travel. You know, that that's important to them. The experiences are more important to them than the dollars that they're getting paid. Yeah. <clears throat> I, so I'm going to share. I, I, uh, I started my career in a very very hierarchical, um, you know, environment. Um, I was in a, in a university, which is very, very bureaucratic and then moved over to their healthcare side. And <clears throat> then I took a job in a very similar situation in a, in a marketing firm. And I, it was, it was very hard for me. Like it was shell shock. Like I didn't understand. And you know, I wasn't my best self in that role. And, um, you know, I'm wondering how you found that transition. Yeah, it was, it was a little difficult at first and it wasn't necessarily the transition of, I get to work from home or things like that. It was, I'll, I'll never forget. Um, I had a conversation as part of my interview process with the CEO of the company. It was the last round. And, and he asked, how was I, how did I handle um, or have I worked in a company that was fast paced and changed a lot? And I said, I'm coming from a healthcare background. Well, we were literally open 24 seven, 365. Like, I don't know how much more fast paced that you can get than working for an industry that doesn't, it doesn't stop. It doesn't close. I mean, I was, you know, on the phone at night, 10, 11 o'clock at night. I was on my email at five o'clock in the morning. I was working on the weekends. Like I was always working. It was always busy. And I'll never forget. He said to me, take that fast pace in times of by a hundred. And you might get close to how quickly things change here. And I kind of laughed, I kind of like brushed him off a little bit. I was like, Oh, okay. I got it. And then I started and it took me like a good two months to feel like I was actually on solid ground because things moved and changed so quickly. And I was learning a new industry. I was learning a new terminology. Um, I, I was thrown into it like week three, I was out, um, onboarding an acquisition out in, in California. They had acquired a company and I was coming on board to help integrate them onto, into our platforms. Um, you know, found out day, I think it was day one that we were changing all of our benefits and perks. And I was going to announce that to the entire company. We changed our name within the first three weeks. Like it was just one after another, after another. And it took me, like I said, about two months to feel like I was actually on solid ground, that I knew what I was doing. Like I was very, very unorganized, which is not like me. I was just kind of all over the place. And I remember I had a six month um, check in with my CEO and I was like, I'm really sorry. Like I apologized to him. I was like, I blew you off when you said that comment to me of take it by a hundred and you might come close. I'm like, I didn't think that it could be that fast paced. I'm like, and it, it threw me for a loop for how quickly things moved here. I was like, so I'm really sorry for that. Like I didn't take it seriously, but um, yeah, it definitely, it was, it was an, an eye opener for me, just how quickly that industry changes. Yeah. And um, you know, we talk a lot about work-life balance today and um <clears throat> and wellness and, and, and whatnot. And I'd love to understand sort of what your company is uh, focused on your, your current company is focused on now in, in that space and, and how you're meeting your employees needs that way. Yeah. So work-life balance, you know, I, I think that's obviously it's very important for everybody. So, you know, we have a, I would say it's an unspoken rule, but, you know, especially at an executive team level, like we are getting requests bounce at us from all over the place. We're getting requests from employees, from management, from our, our private equity partners. And so like as an executive team, we don't bother anybody after business hours. Like we don't, you know, we don't send anybody Slack messages. We try not to email anybody at night to let everybody know that like, we understand like once you check out of work, we as an executive team are not going to bother each other unless it's an absolute emergency. Like we just, we can't, we try to leave it for work hours. Um, and, we, and any other departments do that, do that as well. Of You know, we're not reaching out to you. Um, you know, very limited people that have are allowed to have like their email on their on their phones, you know, so we're, we don't we're not asking everybody to have their email on their phone. It's really kind of management and above, you know, if you need to have access to it, you know, if something comes up, we need to get get, you know, reach out to you um, via email. And then, you know, for wellness, we um, have a wellness program through our insurance, our insurance broker that we, you know, let everybody know about there's a gym reimbursement, there's behavioral health. Um, there's mental health services. So we're constantly reminding people of like, these are the services that are available um, through, you know, free of charge for you through, through um, our, our benefit program. And we're looking to continue to, to build that out. You know, my, as my function here, 
um, is to review all review all of that and say, okay, these are some of the things that like we need to start to implement. We need to, you know, do um, mental health training. So I, I've done a really great training in the past where we've actually brought a speaker on and she's talked about breaking the stigma when it comes to mental health and, and how do you deal with people who are burned out and, and getting to that point and how do you feel comfortable, managers feel comfortable talking to people. So trying to integrate more of that into the, the organization as a whole. Um, like I said, I'm three, I'm three months in. So my to-do list is, is quite long of like, these are the things, if we want to be a world-class organization that we need to start moving towards. Um, so we'll get there, you know, we're not there yet. I'm, you know, it's, I, I can't come in and be like, oh, I, this, here's my wish list. Give me an unlimited right. amount of dollars to do all of this, you know, trying right. to prioritize what comes first. Um, what can we push off to next year, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me what in your career are you, uh, maybe was your biggest challenge that you faced and what you're most proud of from that perspective? Yeah, I would say probably the biggest challenge that I faced um, is the fact that throughout my career, I've moved a lot. So um, throughout my career, uh, my husband was active duty military for 20 years. So I literally moved every three to four years for almost 20 years straight. And so it's kind of that starting over again, every place you go. And, and it was always for me trying to start over Um at a role that was at a higher level than the role I was at previously. And so I, I was, I would never settle for, I wasn't going to settle for just an entry level role when I knew that I had experience. And so that was probably just a challenge for me of, of literally was being able to start over every time I moved, because as we moved, it wasn't during the time where there was any virtual work. So you couldn't just take it with you and, and, you know, continue to work in other right. States. It was all, you know, back when you were in the office and you had to be in the office and that's what it was. So that was a challenge throughout my career was, okay, how do I, know that I'm going to move every several years, but how do I continue to grow my career while I'm, while I'm moving? And I, I, and I was, and I was able to, I was able to do that. So I would say that's probably my greatest accomplishment. Well, that every, every time I moved, I was able to get a job that leveled me up from the job previously. I did notice that you spent some time in Hawaii and I thought to myself, God, why did she leave? Now I know why. (laughs) <laughs> and it wasn't by choice. We we truly did try to stay there. We when we my husband's duty list came up again, Hawaii was our number one stop. We wanted to stay there. Um, it's a funny story. I actually cried when we got orders to Hawaii because I didn't want to move because it was so far from home. And then when we got orders back to back to the to the mainland of Philadelphia, I cried again because I didn't want to leave. So uh, you know, yes, that's we we tried to stay. They didn't. They weren't having it. They sent us back home, which worked out very well. Our, our family is from the East Coast, so we got home kind of. Um, at the perfect time, we had some family members that got ill while we were, well, mm. once we got home. So it, were, it worked out for the best. But yes, we were not looking to leave Hawaii. We would have loved to have stayed a few more years. Where were you stationed? Uh, Honolulu. Yeah, it is quite a special place for sure. <laughs> My is. girlfriend is from there and I'm like, why did you leave? But it is not an easy place to, you know, it is an island and it's extremely expensive. But um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And I did notice that you had several different jobs, but they all were a progression to something um, like truly building a career, which is pretty remarkable. And, you know, as we, as we change our demographic in the workplace, we find that it, it, we used to, I'll put my old lady hat on. We used to like talk about hoppers in a negative way. And that is not, that's not the culture anymore. And it is not, it is seen as gaining valuable experience in different areas. Um, And uh, that's really, that's really um, remarkable to have been able to do all that, Uh, obviously, while going places you don't even know where you're going to go. (laughs) Um, So, uh, you know, uh, what's next for you? What are you what are you excited about implementing at Rectangle? Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, We have a big initiative going right now. We're um, getting ready to implement a new performance management system. And so I'm really excited to start being able to roll out um, nine box talent assessments with the entire organization and working through succession planning, identifying those those high potential employees right now. Um, working with managers on how to actually, how to truly evaluate their employees. It's been very just subjective and there's been no guidelines as to how you, how you, you know, reward your employees. So I'm really excited to start, to start kicking that off and, and building out, like I said, a, a business partner practice model here where, you know, my team is more involved with the, with the departments, more involved with 
building out competency scorecards for every role and, and working with managers and their teams on um, development plans for their high potentials of like, okay, here's the role you're in now, here's what you need to master in this role, but here's the next role, here's what you need to be able to master in that role. And let's work on some stretch goals of to get you to master the competencies you need in your current role, but let's start some stretch goals of getting you working you towards the next the next role. So I'm super excited for all of that to, to get started, get kicked off. Um, and be able to kind of have my team dig a little further into the day-to-day -day of the operations of the organization, like I said, instead of just being very transactional and just doing recruiting and benefits. And, you know, that's that's what they do. Now, from a, from a succession plan um, and understanding, you know, certainly diff different types of businesses and different organizations have different thoughts on uh, leadership development and um, how you're sort of preparing next level managers. Um, it, it, have you gotten your arms around the, the process um, at Rectangle Health for, for how you develop your managers and things that you might want to be doing there? Yeah, we're actually in the process right now of building out a formal manager training program as well. It's not something that they had. So it will be for both current managers and new managers. So, you know, talking on topics about how do you, you know, not just how do you interview for your team, but how do you delegate to your team? How do you have constructive conversations with your team? How do you manage your team? How do you manage a virtual team? Um, you know, how do you have, the, like I said, those difficult conversations? How do you build your team up? How do you do through do succession planning? How do you do talent management with your team? So that's a real need. Right now, they don't have that. So I'm working very closely with our L&D team on building out a full-blown manager training class um, that we're going to put all managers through. And then we'll put new managers as people get promoted or new managers come on through. Um, really, we'll be teaching them about how we, as, as Rectangle, how we manage our, our workforce. Right. So um, you mentioned uh, remote teams. Are you, is your business remote or are you hybrid or what, are, what, what is the? We're a mix, we're a mix of both. So we do have two offices. We have an office in Valhalla. That's where our corporate office is. And then we have an office in Las Vegas. So if you're close to one of those offices, the expectation is you're in the office three to four days a week. Um, but then we have people that are hundred percent remote. So we have some teams that are fully, fully remote um, my team is kind of half and half. So um, myself and one of the members of my team are remote. And then I do have one person on site in New York and one person on site in Las Vegas. Um, you know, our sales team is kind of half and half. Some are in the office, some are remote. Our marketing team is 100% remote. So we're kind of all over the board um, where it comes to whether people are in the office or are fully remote. So how does that work? How does that work from, uh, do you ever have, you know, challenges with respect to, some people who maybe just by where they live, they're frustrated that they can't be remote or. Yeah, yeah, I would say we definitely have those. Um, and the the in office, being in the office, you know, three to four days a week was a policy that was just implemented at the beginning of this year. So obviously they went fully remote during COVID and then um, they opened the office up and had people in the office five days a week. And then they changed it to, you know, three to four days based on um manager kind of how you agree with your manager and what your days working remotely are going to be. So yeah, I think we'll I think we'll always have those, you know, those discussions or those people. Um, you know, we do have certain positions here that we would consider to be essential that like they need to be in the office five days a week. We have customer service people that are, you know, on the phone with clients all the time. We have people in our shipping department that are shipping on equipment. Like those roles, they have to be in the office right. five days a week. There are there are essential roles. Um, you know, and with the new CEO coming on board, you know, he and I have talked about that. Of do we change that? You know, how how many people are actually abiding by the four days a week in the office? Are there departments, like I said, that can can do less than that? That can do three days at home, or or you know, three days in the office, or two days in the office? You know, HR, finance, development. You know, let's kind of work through that. So it's something that I'm sure that we're gonna we'll revisit here in the next couple of months. Yeah. So um, our our listeners are primarily uh, HR folks, and what you know, what advice would you, do you have for um, maybe somebody starting out new in their career or, you know, or wanting to um, sort of have a trajectory like yours? What what would be your advice to them? Yeah, my advice would be, you know, um, if you're looking to get a foot in the door, I know HR, HR is actually incredibly hard to get into. A lot of people get into HR and they kind of just stay there and they don't move. Um, take, you know, take the risk. Like I said, I, I started out HR through a temp a temp position through a temp agency. That was how I got my start. So don't be afraid, you know, if you're looking to for a new role to jump into that and and 
you know, try out different aspects of, of HR. You know, I've been dedicated doing recruiting. I did dedicated doing um, benefits, you know, so try out those other aspects of HR and then say, okay, maybe I really want to focus on just this part of it, or maybe I want to do a little bit more. And so then you become a generalist and then you have your hands involved in everything, but um, always look for those opportunities to continue to develop yourself. Um, get your certifications, you know, get your SHRM certification or your PHR. It's, it, it shows that you have a true, you understand the, the knowledge base, the whole knowledge base of, of HR. And you actually learn things by taking the certifications that you didn't know, you didn't know about before. I learned every time I took those, I took one of those assessments of, oh, I didn't, I didn't know this. I've been doing this for 15 years now. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know this. So I learned something new as well. Um, so yeah, just look for those opportunities. You know, you, everybody kind of has to start at the bottom. I started at the bottom as well, but I was, I had a goal in mind of, I want to be a CHRO one day. And so I'm going to continue to look for ways to develop my career and get involved and, you know, go outside your comfort zone. Uh, you know, for myself, benefits was not my strong point. I mean, I, I understood it, but benefits was not the most fun thing in the world for me to do. It wasn't my favorite part of HR, but I took a role where I, I was focused specifically on onboard uh, people operations. So I had onboarding, offboarding and benefits and compensations. So, like I was the benefits expert. So I stepped out of my comfort zone of, okay, I don't, I don't like doing benefits on a daily basis, but I need to build my experience in this. I have enough to make myself dangerous, but I need to, to learn it more. And so that was a challenge for me, but it was for me to develop myself of, okay, if I want to get to my role as CHRO in the future, I need to have a well-developed background in all aspects of mm. HR, including benefits, even though it wasn't my favorite. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I, I think that that's really important. I, I spent 18 months as a comp analyst, and I really thought it was the worst 18 months of my life. But it is uh, certainly helpful to understand all those aspects for sure. Um, so I want to thank you so much for joining us and uh, appreciate your insights and thoughts and Lots of luck to you in your um, journey with Rectangle Health and um, appreciate your time. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. We hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. Before we go, we want to thank the sponsor of our show, the Mid-Atlantic Employers Association, more commonly referred to as MEA. MEA provides human resources services to hundreds of businesses across numerous industries every day, bridging gaps that restrain innovation and growth. If you need support around people issues, reach out to meainfo.org. Better people, better outcomes.